بسم الله الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We start by praising Allah bestowing peace and blessing upon his beloved prophet messenger the final messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to proceed I greet you with the warmest greetings, the greetings of all the messengers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon the entire gathering. I think that you have been hearing a number of speeches regarding the topic of the nafs, the, the desires, the base desires, lusts and desires. I myself was listening to my brother Imran, and I suspect that many of the talks have been quite similar, although I haven't been, had the benefit of talk, uh, hearing all of them. I'd like to try to kind of change the slant of the discussion slightly and talk about a way that we can create the basis, the foundation for some social change which will enable us to refocus the self. Refocus the self and, and some practical steps that we can take towards recreating a reality for ourselves today. Because today, the backdrop that we're living in is quite scary in many respects. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've been a Muslim now, alhamdulillah, for around 21 and a half years. And I've seen almost a paradigm shift in that time. A, almost, a, you know, a, a tidal wave, you know, shift. But, but it's, it's been obviously over the last 20 years, so you don't know it's happened in many respects. I do. But many of you probably haven't been a Muslim, a Muslim for as long as well. And most of them actually left, the young kids, by the way. You notice that? Talk, talk about tidal waves, man. They all left. <laughs> Oh, that, what does that guy know? That old guy. You know, he doesn't know anything. Imran, he's the guy I came to listen to. You know, he <laughs> said. But there has been a sea change. When I was a young Muslim, and I was 26 when I embraced Islam, I used to frequent the masajid. The masjids in I embrace Islam in Balam. Balam Masjid, Balham, the gateway to the south, South London, you see. And I I remember distinctly that wherever I used to go, people used to give me advice. You know that thing? People used to come to me and say, Ya Yusuf. You know, the etiquettes of the Salah are like this and this and this. And did you know that charity is smiling at your, you know, your companion in the street? And spread the salams, ease your way to the paradise. And be good to your neighbor, Yusuf. And read the Quran every day. And come on Tabliki Jamaat with me, Yusuf. Come, come in the way of your Lord. And Yusuf, lower your gaze in the streets. I remember distinctly, the longer I was a Muslim, the less and less and less this type of thing has occurred or is occurring. Am I right? When was the last time somebody gave you a nasiha? Good Advice, which of course the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in a sahih hadith, he said, ad-deena nasiha, 
Very simple. That this religion is nothing more or nothing less than good advice. Sounds sahih good advice. Look at you today. Look around you today. You can't even find people giving you advice. And when they do give you advice, you can't take it. Is it not true? As a, is it, put your hands up if that's something you've actually realized is happening to you more and more on a daily, on a weekly, on an hourly basis. You're not noticing that people are coming like they used to. Wallahi, this is a fitan. It is, a, it is actually, you know, this is a punishment. It's a punishment. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a sahih hadith, another hadith, either you will command the good and you will forbid the evil, you know, meaning you will give da'wah, you will give nasiha to your friend, your neighbor, to your, the person you do know and the person you don't know, the group that you don't know, the group that you do know. Either you will do this, or we will send upon you a calamity. And when you raise your hands to make dua to stop this calamity, you ask Allah to stop the calamity, your dua will be ignored. You see? And the calamity is that we're not giving dua, to, we're not giving advice to each other. This is part of the calamity. And because of that, when you're alone, there's no one to protect you against yourself. Muhammad is not calling you anymore when you're on the verge of, as the brother had mentioned, seeing something or having a relationship with somebody on social media. There's nothing to stop you because Muhammad is not calling you anymore. Sumaya, she didn't call you. Sumaya is not coming to your door anymore. She's not meeting you in college like she used to in the canteen and saying, giving you one hadith a day. And the father, he's not meeting the mother. And the mother's not meeting the father. And they're not talking about the deen of Allah. And the father is not talking to the child. And the child is not talking to the father. And the father is on his own at night. And he's traveling in the car on his own at night. And he's with shaitan and with his desires. And he's doing things because no one is there to advise him. And no one, is, no one cares anymore. We've become selfish. We used to be an ummah. We used to be a nation of people that were supporting each other, that were kind to each other, that would smile to each other, that would make sadaqah with each other, would remind, remind each other on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, on a minute by minute basis. This is one of the things that I have noticed in the last 26 years, 22 years. Since I embraced Islam at the age of 26. We've become more and more selfish. And we, we need each other. We are an ummah. We are a nation. We are a community. We are a collective. We, are ident we identify ourselves as people that love the one true man that ever walked this earth, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we, it is a point of fact, brothers and sisters, and I'm talking to myself as well, that we should be loving this man, and therefore his, his way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more than we love ourselves, more than we love our wives. Sisters more than we love our husbands, more than we love our brothers and sisters and our mothers and our fathers, our aunties and our uncles. And more than we love ourselves, ourselves, our, de our nafsi nafsi, more than the we love all of the wealth that we can achieve or that we, we think that, we, that will be good for us. Nafsi nafsi. 
We have got to the point now. This is the backdrop. The backdrop is one of isolationism. Isolationism. Actually, for the last 40 to 50 years, we Muslims have lived our lives by and large in an isolationist mode. You see? So, you know, you have, for example, in 18, 1889, you know, Abdullah Quilliam's model. You see, you have that model, Abdullah Quilliam. You're thinking Quilliam, well, you're thinking uh, government think tanks, right? No, I'm not talking about, well, they stole his name, yes. But they didn't steal his model, right? They stole someone else's model, right? But Abdullah Quilliam's model was he embraced Islam in Morocco, he came back to Liverpool, and he, he bought Islam. He bought the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he said, he said in his shahada, Ashhadu, I testify, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, that there's no God but Allah. There's nothing worthy of worship but Allah. And the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is my messenger. And I will obey that messenger. So instead of just paying lip service to that statement, to that shahada tain, to that twin declaration of magnificent faith, that man, Abdullah Quilliam, implemented the statement right in front of you, right there, right now, in number two city in the world at that time, Liverpool. Liverpool. Great football team, yeah? Used to be anyway. When I was growing up as a kid, it used to be great. But this man embarked upon a mission, and he says in his writings, to bring this beautiful deen to that city. So the first thing he does is he sets up a center. A center which is all about social change and engagement to bring Islam to the people in Liverpool. Why is it so amazing this? Because at that time, by his own admission, admission in his book, he says, I was the only Muslim in Liverpool. According to his understanding, he was the only Muslim in Liverpool. And there was a time when a man came to him in one of his talks, because he was doing, uh, you know, monthly talks, giving da'wah to the people in Liverpool. That the man who came, and he followed him all the way back to his house, and he got to the gate of his house, and he called upon Abdullah. He said, Abdullah, I like everything you've told me. How do I become a Muslim? He said, you say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. What? Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. The only problem is, you see, I need two male witnesses. And I'm the only Muslim that I know. May Allah be the witness that you are the second Muslim in Liverpool. From there onwards, alhamdulillah, this man gave shahada by his hands to 660 people in Liverpool. These are the people that we only know about from him. He then opened an orphanage called the Medina House Orphanage. The Medina House Orphanage. By the end of two years, he had 50 children under his care, teaching them the deen of Islam. But he wasn't content with that, because he knew that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ahsana, if you want to do something, you do with excellence. So he started to teach the children grammar, Arabic grammar. He started to teach them Quran. He taught them fiqh. He taught them algebra. 
He taught them algorithms, about algorithms. He taught them logic. He started to teach them Latin and Greek. He wanted them to be the best people in the society. He wanted to replace himself. And these were orphans. There was a, a, a story of one Jewish lady that came to him and he purchased the, the son because, for 50 pounds. He gave her a donation and took the son so he could teach the, that son Islam. And it is said in one poet, one poet said in the Liverpool Echo, that if this man, Abdullah Quilliam, was to ride his white stallion through the streets of Liverpool, that the women would come out and throw the flowers at the feet of the horse. This is not an isolationist mode. This is an engagement mode. This is what we should all be doing. This is what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught us to do. He taught us to go in the marketplaces. He taught us to go and look after our neighbors, to move things out of harm's way in the streets, to stop nafsi nafsi and get on with the other guys and start talking to them and being part of the community. He created the hub of the community. The masjid of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was not called a masjid with domes and minarets and green writing and foreign languages. Think about it. You're a British guy, right? You're walking past and you see this building. Masjid al-Sunnah. Masjid Abu Bakr al-Sadiq radiallahu anhu. Now I'm in Britain, right? And these guys have been here for 50 years. They've never told me, what is it they do in that masjid? Let me go and find out. Let's go to Sheikh Google. Yeah, let's put in Islam in Sheikh Google. And what are the responses that you're going to get? Every evil soothsayer that's got anything to do with, you know, with hating on Islam will be there to respond to that man. Where are the Muslims? I don't know. Oh, they're in the isolationist mode. That's why. So the second masjid that was established in Liverpool was Masjid al rahma Beautiful place, yeah? It's made of beautiful, you know, finery and, and mar marble floors and so on and so forth. And I knocked on the door of the neighbor. The first neighbor. First of all, when I knocked on the door, she saw us outside, me and this one other brother. And she tried to change, <laughs> close the door. And I said, well, wait a minute, my dear. It's all right, I've got something for you. I've got a gift for you. I said, where are you from? Are you from that place next door? The one that keeps me awake all the time? With their music? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I do come from there. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Has anyone ever... Has anyone ever knocked on your door and welcomed you and said hi? How long have you been here, by the way? She said 30 years. And she said, no one has ever, ever invited me. No one's ever knocked on my door for 30 years. Not one person had taken the time out to get out of nafsi, nafsi, isolationist mode, me, me, iPhone, my phone, you phone, dumb phone, mode, the I, the me, to come and invite me. Just to see, hi, how you doing, man? I'm your neighbor. You're right, babe. No one. 
Isn't that shocking? Now compare the two models and know why the calamity has come across the Muslims today. You go in isolationist mode, someone's going to come and wake you up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send you a calamity. The calamity is now. Will offset, they're going to be visiting your local, kid, your local school soon. Wake up. Get out of the isolationist mode before it gets too late. Move things out of harm's way. Become a social activist. Change the condition of the people. First of all, change the condition of yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He will not change the condition of you, yourself, inside you, inside you, that nafsi nafsi, until what? Until what? You will not change until you change you. You make the first move, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change your heart. He will make you less nafsi nafsi and more me us us. Assi assi. <laughs> you see? You see the two models? Seriously. For 26, no, I keep saying 26 years. I embraced Islam in 26. But for 22 years, I've been traveling around and I've, seen, I've been talking about this. And now, unfortunately, by the end of next month, Prevent will become probably part of the legal obligation of every, of every agency, government agency, for them to report anyone who has Islamic behavioral patterns to the authorities, right? It's a, sea, it's a sea change. Because we didn't go out with Islam. They're coming to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending them to us. So we have to deal with them now. The authorities. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to deal with this situation? Are we going to go further and further into isolationist mode? We can say, oh, it's all right. I'm not really with them. The guy with the beard? Yeah, I'm a Muslim, but I'm not really with him. Are we going to join that crowd? A lot of them out there now. Or are we going to go and find the people in authority and insist that we sit down with them, we meet them, and we discuss things in an open and free and fair manner? Are we going to do that? Are we going to get engaged politically? You see, Ibn Taymiyyah, he said about these type of situations in these times, he said that it's an obligation for us to get involved politically. When are we going to start doing that? Political engagement. Not just one little house. You do, okay, you live in a house, right? Where's that house going to go when you die? Be inherited, right? If you write your will, because most of us haven't written a will, by the way. Yes, yeah, statistically, I think it's about 80% of us don't have a will. Put your hands up if you've got an Islamic will. Allahu Akbar. Oh, David Cameron's taking your house. Oh, dear. Problem, eh? Seriously, we're not even preparing to allow our children to take our wealth. But when your children do take your wealth, well, there's no guaranteeing they're going to make dua for you. I'm telling you that from my own personal experience, right? So you don't even own your house. You live in it, but it's not even your wealth. It's just a place that you keep in until the angel of death comes to visit you. Think about the reality of this world. How long are you going to live 
in a deluded state. How long are we, we, Nahnu, going to live in this deluded state? How long? How long do you have to change? Tonight, maybe? Now. We need to make a sincere intention now that we are going to change individually and collectively. We're going to change as a community here in Slough. Maybe, uh, who's from Slough, by the way? Is anyone from Slough? Surprising, isn't it, really? Is anyone from outside Slough? I am. Well, that's quite a few people, mashallah. So, you're going to go back to your society, your community, your environment, yeah? You go back to your house, and the first port of call is you, right? So, you've got to draw a circle around yourself. This is this, the practical realities of your life. Draw the circle around yourself. First, number one, nafsi, nafsi, I've got to go to paradise, yeah? I don't want to go to Jahannam, right? So, the first thing you've got to do Draw the circle around yourself and see where, what am I going to change about my life so that I can go to paradise. So what are those things? What, what are they? Give me some ad advice myself. I need advice as well. We need to talk about this. It's not a lecture. We need to have a real, you know, what is it? Real talks, bruv. You know, let's do the real talks, bruv. Two, two. Is it one, one? Is it one, one? Two, two. Yeah? Learn this from my son, you see. What are the things that we need to change about ourselves? First of all, number one. I think above all that we all need to make regular dhikr of Allah. Dua. We need to call upon Allah regularly. We need to read the Quran. In a language of our understanding, not a language where you don't understand, you're just reading it for the sake of reading it. I'm talking about reading it with tafsir, with understanding. If you can't understand it, you can't read that well, find a person who can. He might be your neighbor. Frequently, Muslims live with other Muslims in the same street. Go to the neighbors. Knock on the door of the neighbor. By the way, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to talk about the neighbors to such an extent that the companions thought they were going to inherit from them. That is the reality. Go to your neighbors. Might be a non-Muslim. Excuse me, can you help me read the Quran? <laughs> Why not? They'd be shocked. First of all, he, he knocked on my door. I'll be honest, how many of you have knocked on the door of your neighbor in the last week? Put your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. How many lives next to their mother and father, right? <laughs> Seriously. That's a problem. Do you know, I moved when I moved to Leicester. I was busy, like a whirlwind, running around, as usual. And my neighbor, when I was out, they came with a bunch of flowers and gave it to my wife. I felt so gutted that I didn't do that first. You want to you wanna control your nafs? Go and give some of your wealth. Go to your four neighbors. You know what the prophet, the, 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 prophet, the understanding of the neighbor is in Islam? It's not hadith. Just the understanding of the scholars. Arba'in. Forty this side. Forty this side. Forty over here and forty over there. Forty neighbors. That's your neighbor. Forty doors. Now, the average household in a Muslim area is going to be like 10, so that's 400 there. More than that, sorry, my maths is pretty bad. Massive number of neighbors, the responsibility in Islam, you see. 
So the second circle you draw, the concentric circle, is around your dependents, your children, your loved ones, the one that you don't want to lose, that your wife, your husband, sisters. And the third circle is the neighbors. The third circle is the neighbors. Now, if we start to understand the social change model, and we live in, that, in those three concentric circles, we just focus on those three concentric circles. By the way, this can include your, of course, your colleagues in your workplace, because they're kind of like categorized as your neighbors, right? your associates, let's call them. And you focused on just doing, being a, an amazing Muslim. Your street becomes cleaner. Because you live in that street. That's your street. Your garden is the most beautiful garden in the... Don't look at mine, by the way. Your garden is the most beautiful garden in the streets. Blessings are coming out of your doorway because you've given so much food to your neighbors. They think you're the local restaurant. You see? free restaurant and every time you go you leave your house you spread the salams to the people peace be upon you assalamu alaikum to the muslim and smile for this is an act of charity and they will come to you and I want you to reflect on this. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spent how many years? 40 years before he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, got wahi. Okay, so for 40 years, he was with the people. And what did they call him? Halimi. Right? The most trustworthy one amongst them. The, trust, the trusted one. So for 40 years he was known as the best. And when he started to call the people, they listened to him. Even though they didn't want to, they had to listen to him because they knew he was the best. So we need, if it's social change model, we need to, in those three circles, we need to start working on showing that Islam has given us the best akhlaq, the best manners, the best ways, the best way of speech, more gifts given, more smiling, less corruption. So that when the people hear something in the, on the BBC, they see something in Google, they see something in here, that one of their work colleagues is, you know, talking evilly and badly against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Quran, or talking badly against the Muslims, they're going to come to you. Because they want to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. To the practical realities of being a Muslim in these times. And I often get very worried about social media. I actually hate social media because it's everything that's against the society, actually. It is not social, it is anti social. Brothers and brothers are having fights and wars all the time. Sisters and sisters and sisters and brothers fighting each other on social media all the time. You know what has got to the stage now? Where I have so many ex-Muslims, by the way, ex-Muslims, yeah? It's attacking me, attacking Imran, attacking... Whoever it is, yeah? You know what I did the other day? I put up a little post saying, to all 
ex-Muslims. If you wish to come and meet me, I am prepared to buy you lunch. Yeah? Please, RSVP. Open invitation. Last week, or the week before, I met two. I met two. One of them bought me lunch, by the way. The other one, I bought lunch. He insisted. I said, okay, fine. Halas. You know? By the end of it, this ex-Muslim and this ex-Muslim, they realized there was no need to say anything bad on social media. You see? The real social media is man on man. Cooperation, communication throughout the nation. Isn't it? Really? It's so simple, man. Yeah, how you doing, bro? You're right. Yeah, well, I left Islam. Yeah, you did? Come and have a coffee, cup of coffee with me. Let's talk about it, man. You know what? In, the, in those two meetings, I didn't talk about Islam. I talked about everything else apart from Islam. Now, the council of ex-Muslims are now having beef with those guys. You see what I mean? Why did it? Ha Why are we so short-sighted? We've lost the ability to communicate with each other. Humans, we are humans. Insan. Kulu nafsin ekata al maut. That every soul will taste of death very soon. That ex-Muslim and me and you and all of us and all of us alive, we will be no more. And we couldn't talk to each other with sincerity from our hearts. Social change model is what can revolutionize revolutionize our ummah for us to get back what we have lost are we khusr are we in a state of khusr in a state of loss have we forgotten do we really really believe in allah do we even know? How can you love a man if you've never read about him? You see, this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can you love him if you didn't read his sirah? <laughs> Many people here today probably haven't read it. How can you call the book of instruction, the Quran, the book of instruction? The Quran, your manual for life, and yet you didn't even read it. How? I'm talking to myself. May as well be, right? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Seriously, guys, we need to start thinking out of the box. And we need to have communication with each other. We need to, seriously, if there's so, uh, something I'd like to end this talk on, it's I want you guys to start to re-engage. And when you send, when you send a message to your brothers and sisters on social media, just make it one ting, bruv. Sorry, bro. I'm still in the limelight now. One thing. Invite them with wisdom and fair preaching, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Invite them with wisdom and fair preaching. Bring them on. Change the narrative. Change the paradigm. 
Don't go and say, yo, bruv, what you've said is wrong. No, invite them to, for a coffee and speak to them man on man. Yeah? Hi. Someone else is trying to do it right now. There we are. What do you think, bro? So, inshallah, I pray that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to, you know, to be able to be, uh, you know, instrumental in changing the situation that we are in currently. And to know that To know that really, you know, the situation is for the changing and we can be the change. We don't want to wait for another person to wake up today and start to make the change for us because it's not really going to happen, to be honest. Even your most dear ones, they're not going to change your own situation. You need to be the change. You need to be the change that inspires your whole street. I want you to imagine something. Imagine that a thousand people, a thousand Muslims, they wake up tomorrow morning in Slough with this social change model in their minds. What would be the effect? Would it be good or would it be bad? Just the individual, you see? Just the individual. But times it by a thousand individuals, right? Like someone like Abdullah Quilliam. You know, he's got 600 people, right? 660 people. Imagine that. So this is my real message about the nafs and the changing the individual, changing the self. And then extending it out to changing your loved ones and changing the neighbors and changing your associates and the people you do your business deals with and so on and so forth until it becomes a holistic change in the society. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all of those, uh, that type of person and uh, for us to love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than we love ourselves. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, anything that I've said which is correct, then may Allah reward us all and change our hearts and our intentions with that. And anything I've said which is incorrect is from the evil of my own self. And it is incorrect. Therefore, so jazakallah khair wa salamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله أنت استغفر الله وأتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتوصوا بالحق وتوصوا بالصبر سلام عليكم